I think we're live. All right, welcome you guys to the Dr. G Show. This is episode uh, 193, and we're talking, uh, wait a minute, is that right? Yeah, so we're talking about like health and sanity, we're talking about why everybody should be chronically sick and dying prematurely, right? We live in a country where uh, we're the, some of the sickest, the fattest, the dumbest population on the planet. We have the highest anxiety, highest depression, highest chronic management uh, of all diseases. So like three out of every four Americans is chronically managed, a chronic condition, and we're all just kind of falling apart. And, you know, this is a relatively new thing for America, and so it's been a long time coming, but all of it's been this sudden epidemic of disease. And so instead of just going back and saying, well, what did we do to cause the disease? We just simply manage it. So we manage it with lots of medications. We manage it with lots of supplements. But my kind of practice, you know, we do functional lifestyle medicine. It's know how the body works, know what we do to mess it up, and then teach people to stop messing it up. So <laughs> we do things a little different here. So on the Dr. G show, uh, we want to... Uh, take a several segments here and talk about not why are people sick, but of course you should be chronically sick, right? The things that you eat and drink and breathe and rub it on your skin and how you stress, you should be falling apart, right? So if I put water down and gas in my car, it ain't going to work right either. So why would we expect to live a life worth living if we're not living a lifestyle that's consistent with life longevity? Oh, my gosh. Every time. Every time. Look at my hair. It's all crazy looking. I don't know what's going on with this. All right. So, crazy hairdo. Um, hey, there's Natalia. Uh, good to have you on here. Um, as you guys have questions that we're talking about, let me know. Last week, we read uh, a chapter for adulteration of food uh, from 1907 that talked and warned us about all this toxic stuff that we're doing. So, we went and we covered um, the epidemics in the U.S., and then we talked about Gatorade, its ingredients. We talked about soda and its ingredients and why people should be really kind of falling apart for this. You know, in every or episode years ago, this is... Uh, Five years we've been doing the show. We've covered just about everything there is. Um, but one of the episodes, we talked about the food that's banned in other countries, but perfectly fine in the U.S., right? So, like, our bread would get you prison in other countries. Um, our candy is not the same in other countries. So we do all this stuff where we poison you for profit, and then we act like things are genetic, but only 1% of things are genetic. So we've had lots of shows about this. Um and so today we want to cover a few more drinks, and we'll talk about one of my favorite topics, and um, it's Dairy is the Devil. We'll talk about Diet Coke, we'll talk about energy drinks, and, uh, and autoimmune conditions, which is pretty much like everybody now. So, all right, you guys ready to strap in? So... Let's, uh, so we stopped with soda. We talked about all that, the 39 grams of sugar in there. Um, we talked about how it causes fatty liver disease in the body, all that kind of stuff. So with diet soda, um, diet soda, you know, by, so this is the deal, right? We lived in this country forever. We have all these people from all over the world, and it's really hard to cause, um, a lot of uh, health conditions, right? And then we got really good at it. And really before the 1800s, we didn't have a weight problem. Uh, there's this really good picture of a cop. Uh, it's a side side-by-side picture. It was a cop in 2001, maybe. And then there's a picture of the world's fattest man in 1900. And they're the same size. In 1900, the biggest we could ever come up with is just like a cop in New York City now, Right? So it was really difficult to create a huge amount of obesity. You had to be crazy rich to be obese, right? 
So for, you know, centuries, people that were fat were, like, revered because they had so much money to afford so much extra food and everybody else was starving. But America changed all that. We figured out how to make staples of your American diet and then make those uh, create huge amounts of weight very, very quickly, right? So we're now the leaders of childhood obesity with the biggest babies in the world, the biggest children in the world, the biggest adults in the world. We have more obesity, or sorry, uh, yeah, obesity than overweight people for the first time in history. Think about that. More obese than overweight. That's crazy, right? So before the 1800s, we really didn't import sugar. So when we talk about like diet soda and why we, we ended up with this and all the autoimmunes that come with it, it all started with that importing of sugar. Hey, Julie. Uh, glad to have you on. And so before that, you know, if you look at like um, Robinson Crusoe, I was reading this to my daughters one night, and in the book he says, you know, he's dreaming of the, uh, the sweet foods of his homeland. And he said, peas and carrots. And that, like, bothered me for some reason. Because as soon as I said, you know, this guy on this island, he's trapped. He's, like, dreaming of these sweet foods. And he says, peas and carrots. And my American brain says, peas and carrots are not sweet. Right? What the hell is this dude talking about? So, literally, weeks went by. And I was just like, what the hell is this dude talking about? So, I looked it up. The book was written in the 1700s. And guess what? That was before the import of added sugar. So, before you added sugar and changed the whole dynamics of the neurochemistry of the brain to determine what is uh, sweet, peas and carrots were really sweet. That's why they call them sweet peas. That's why they make cake out of carrots, right? When you change your diet, you get rid of sugar, carrots actually taste sweet. Grapes are almost too sweet. So, we then started adding about 10 pounds of sugar to our diet every year in America by 1910, right? 10, 10. But in 1910, the average adult weighed 128 pounds. The average man was about 145 pounds. The average woman was, I think, 105 pounds, maybe 110 pounds, right? Sounds like crazy talk these days. But that's what adults actually look like. You could see their ribs. You could see their, you know, maybe some stomach muscle. But, you know, we could see hip bones. We were just a thin society because it was really hard to cause a bunch of weight gain. Then, by the 1940s, we had amped that 10 pounds a year up to about 140 pounds a year. And at that point, we created what's called type 2 diabetes, which is sugar diabetes. We now have type 3 diabetes which is brain diabetes, which mimics Alzheimerism, right? So now we had people in the 1940s gaining weight. By the 1950s, we had noticeable weight changes, right? And we had no clue how to get rid of the weight. We were feeding people staples that were dramatically increasing their weight. We were feeding them all kinds of different forms of sugar. And sugar's more addictive than crack cocaine, so everybody's happy. It's super profitable. But what the hell are we going to do with this population that's gaining too much weight? So, that's when you watch all those crazy-ass things that they had in the 1950s and 60s where they had the jiggler, and it would jiggle the fat away. That didn't work. They had the rollers that go up and down, and they roll away the fat. Right? We have all kinds of crazy, crazy uh, stuff, even today, where it's like, we're going to lay the fat away, and we're going to heat the fat away, and if you just drink some tea and you eat 150 pounds of sugar, you'll just melt that fat away. It's all craziness. But the reason it's so crazy is because we've never had to figure out how to make unfat people in the population ever. <laughs> right? So... We went from 145-pound men to 200-pound men and 105-pound women to say, I don't want to say, I will, I'm not going to say it. Hey, there's Dr. K, Dr. Kelly. Uh, <coughs> so <laughs> that's why all this stuff seems so, so ridiculous. This is why, like, Tufts University says, like, every diet in America failed. 
And it doesn't matter what we do because we never address why the hell we ended up this way in the first place. All we do is kind of just short-term it. So, jiggling the fat away didn't work. We just kept putting more and more sugar in food. And because it uh, increased profits, everybody's happy except for the population. So then they're eating rice crackers and fasting and doing intermittent fasting and throwing up and purging and doing all this horrible stuff, right? Well, I guess intermittent fasting is not horrible. So, <laughs> Which, by the way, your boy here was going to fast for 14 days. And I do wonderful fasting. So I've gotten to 13 days, I don't know, like three times, two times. I think three times now. And I haven't quite made that 14th day. Usually by day 13, I'm just in a position where I just fall, accidentally eat, you know? And then I'm like, ah, screw it, and then I eat, right? So day seven or day six on my fast, I'm like, I'm doing great. You know, I've been able to go out with my friends and, and have martinis and still just not eat, right? So then Saturday comes. And I do wonderful if I'm just out, I can run and work out. And I, as long as I'm keeping busy, I'm perfectly fine. But Saturday, I decided to just stay at home. I just sat in the, in, in the recliner and I just watched old movies and uh, hung out with my cats. Just like easy going, uh, like Sunday morning, right? If you guys know what that means. That means. And then it was just like, well, mm, you know, I went to the Whole Foods and I had our natural groceries and I bought a bunch of stuff that was on sale. And there was a bunch of kind of sweet stuff that I got for my girls that were, you know, relatively healthy. And then I was just like, ate one little thing and then it all came unraveled. So we all fell. We all restart and we all get back on track. So, uh, I'm starting again Monday, so it'll be okay. So I did like two days again, and then I was like, ah, okay. I just, I just need to have my meditation, mindfulness, fasting, water, get back in the thing, and not be alone at home watching movies. Okay, that's the problem. All right. Anyways, so people do fasting. That's fine. Um, but by the 1980s, people were just out of control. Every diet kept ending up creating a yo-yo diet. And just like Tufts University says, uh, if you lose weight, which is the least common thing to happen with a diet, you'll gain uh, uh, all the weight you lost plus 50% more within the six months after you quit that diet because you didn't change lifestyle, right? Um, so America had to come up with a solution for this. And our solution was gasoline is sweet. We can take gasoline, take the benzene, which is the flammable part of the gasoline that explodes and makes leukemia and lymphoma, and we can make formaldehyde with that. So we can take cancer-causing flammable benzene and make formaldehyde. But instead of preserving grandma or, or uh, dead frogs, um, why not make diet stuff out of it? So we created aspartame, and aspartame uh, became Diet Coke. So in 1980, we came out with Diet Coke and a whole entire population consuming 150 pounds of sugar. Um, <laughs> you said, don't go to the store when you're fasting. Yes. That was my big mistake. Because I was like, I'll just get some Chipotle vegan A's just so I have it when I get down to them. <laughs> that was the biggest mistake ever. Biggest mistake. Um, so... Um, so you have this whole entire population that can't figure out how to lose weight now has this miracle substance called Diet Coke, right? That is sweetened with formaldehyde converted to aspartame. And then aspartame actually converts back to formaldehyde at 87 degrees. So your body is about 98 degrees, uh, just like the group, right? Uh, and then if you're 98 degrees, and that's 87 degrees, then it's in sync, and then, no, it somehow fit Backstreet Boys in there, I don't know. Anyway, so you are drinking formaldehyde, and that's what we see. Like, autoimmune disease is very low, and in 1984, 
boom, sudden epidemic, uh, 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 MS, just like that. The epicenter of all autoimmune and things like multiple sclerosis is 1984. The beginnings of two brand new diseases called chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia was 1984. 1984 is when it all fell apart. We created two new brand new epidemics, right? So, should you have chronic fatigue? Should you have fibromyalgia? Should you have autoimmune conditions? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You definitely should. If you consume any forms of benzene derived aspartame, neotame, acetylcholine, you should have autoimmune conditions, let alone leukemia and lymphoma, right? But you should have it. The fact that everybody that drinks it doesn't, that's just amazing, but they are almost there because three out of four people have a chronic inflammatory condition, and for some people that's going to be lupus, some is uh, uh, Raynaud, some is uh, MS, some is chronic fatigue, some is fibromyalgia, but our bodies cannot consume systematic amounts of this stuff. And if you look at something like gum, the most gum has three fake sugars made from formaldehyde, aspartame, neotame, sepultane. So how long can you consume these chemicals from diet stuff and gum before your immune system falls apart? So when you see people, again, this whole show, this whole series we're doing now, is of course, of course you should have these things. Not why. It's not genetic. Well, oh, I... I drink gasoline and my genes don't like that. Yeah, right? If I stop drinking gasoline, all of a sudden things get better, right? So this is why we have these miracle patients, is we people don't know that they are just consuming insane amounts of chemicals and then they feel chronically sick. And the minute you say stop doing this and you teach them to not do it, everything works. Your genetics are designed to heal. Your physiology is designed to heal. But we do everything to poison the body. And I had a patient here who was just like, well, that's a, just a small amount, and it's generally recognized as safe, and it's just a... Yeah, okay. In every single food that you consume, every bit of drinks you consume, all the plastic products you consume, all the plastic clothes you wear, all the perfume, cologne, scented shampoos, conditioners, lotions, how much can you eat, drink, and wear before it overwhelms your ability to detoxify or reverse the genetic mutations that you're causing? In the sickest, fattest, dumbest population with most anxiety and depression, not a whole lot, right? So I'm okay with people that want to disagree. Uh, be fine with that. I don't care, right? But if you're chronically sick and you're tired of being chronically sick, uh, this is a really good idea to maybe not poison yourself. <laughs> I'm such a dick about this stuff. So I love what I do, but oh my gosh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, it's literally like someone like, man, I've been putting water down gas in my car and it's just, it's knocking and pinging. Like, do you think I should buy something to add to the car to make it not knock and ping so much? And they'll sell you something. Doctors like me would be like, Mm, don't put water, water down gas in your car, right? Stop causing the problem. So, the big thing is, this is the most twisted thing about this whole thing. This is the joke about drinking formaldehyde. Uh, research keeps coming out over and over, and they talk about it on the news, but people that consume diet food actually gain more weight than if you just drank sugar. We said last week, soda has 39 teaspoons of sugar. That will make you less fat than if you drank formaldehyde diet soda. So all the diet things are horribly toxic. So you, not only do you get fatter, but you get a bonus autoimmune disease with this. So now you're overweight, frustrated, pissed off, and now your joints are attacking themselves. Wonderful, wonderful. What should we cope with? Hmm, how about soda, <laughs> candy, wheat and dairy? So, next week we're going to talk about food.
and the additives with that, right? Breaks some stuff down. So diet stuff is horrific, but they also put this in stuff they don't call diet now. So they're actually uh, considering putting uh, aspartame in milk to make milk even sweeter so they sell more of it. So don't ever do diet. I always say you're better off losing your toes to diabetes than your whole immune system to formaldehyde. And let alone, the other thing too is, you know, some people, I, I've had patients who are like, well, you know, I buy stuff from the ice cooler, so the Diet Coke is probably still okay. Well, when you drink it, it becomes formaldehyde. But most of that, like when you go to the store, and the, it's a hot-ass truck that they bring those drinks in. Hot-ass truck baking the plastic estrogens into your actual drink and then converting the formaldehyde uh, from the aspartame and then you're drinking this horrific thing. So, save the drama for your mama. Uh, stop drinking diet stuff. <laughs> All right. And then energy drinks, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know who needs to hear this. But holy shit, energy drinks are so messed up, so messed up, and especially people buy diet energy drinks, diet, so not only do they get formaldehyde, and then they end up, so this is the best thing, we have so much toxic stuff to our immune system now that we eat, drink, breathe, rub on our skin, right, on a daily basis, all day long. We now have these autoimmune-ish conditions. You guys know about this? So now people come in and they have a whole just slew of lab done. They spend a ton of money on it. Uh, that's wonderful, right? Then what? You get diagnosed and put on Humira like, for the rest of your life? And uh, that increases the risk of cancer, like Dallaire, I think, increases the risk of cancer, I don't know, 38% or something. It's crazy high. So energy drinks send 22,000 young Americans to the emergency room every year. Now, it's been a little bit, but, you know, like about 39 kids die from uh, energy drinks a year. But it doesn't seem like a lot, right? But... It's a lot. It's not okay. You know, like, Gardasil kills girls. I think it kills about about the same amount of girls every year, too. So, uh, what the hell's in that? <laughs> I think it's just got some mercury and some antifreeze in there. Um, so, the energy drinks, basically, the risk of heart attack and stroke in the U.S. is one out of two, Right? One out of every two, and now for the first time in history, what, what? Women more likely have heart attacks than men. Hell yeah, right? Uh, because y'all consume stuff, that causes heart disease, right? Birth control can make you have a heart attack or stroke at 16, and then hormone replacement therapy can increase your risk of heart disease by 87% in the first year. So, yeah, you should have more heart attacks. Not why, but yeah, you should have more heart attacks. Plus, you have to put up with us. So, why do men die earlier than women? Because we want to, right? Why are women having more heart attacks than men? Because they're shocked we don't change, right? No, that's terrible. Some guys change. Not many, but a few. Uh, so, hey, and getting worse has changed too, right? I know worse. So, with those energy drinks, um, you know, you might have, like, uh, uh, a bunch of the caffeine that's in there, but you usually have uh, uh, enough to cause a heart attack or stroke in a, in a population where people have a, one out of two have a risk of heart attack or stroke, right? And at younger and younger ages, we see people in their 20s having heart attacks. We saw the... Uh, kids as young as 10 starting to have bone cells or heart disease. So that's wonderful. So let's throw in some free caffeine, right? Now, coffee, a cup of coffee has 200 milligrams of caffeine 
a hundred, two hundred per little cup, right? Uh, something like this. Like I'll nurse on this for like two days. Starbucks sent me some money. Uh, you know, so I got a coconut uh, milk latte, and I might sip on it for a couple of days. If I don't have it, I don't care. It's fine, right? But this is enough caffeine that if you drank this. You should have anxiety all day long, all day, because it only takes 350 milligrams to cause anxiety. It only takes 550 milligrams to cause panic attack. So, again, like we said before, you know, most people's big gulp black tea from uh, Quick Trip should cause anxiety all day. Their Vente Mocha should cause anxiety all day. A couple sodas and a, a whole candy bar should cause anxiety all day long. In fact, a whole candy bar with 10 pieces is enough to cause anxiety all day long. So that is a different type of caffeine even with that, right? So that 100 to 200 milligrams of caffeine, sure, but no one's having a heart attack or stroke from coffee. Nobody's having a heart attack or stroke from black tea, which is racist. Just saying. But Red Bull only has 85 milligrams of caffeine. Now, Monster's 160 but why are people having heart attacks and strokes at young ages from less caffeine than they're probably getting from coffee or even black tea? And that's because when you consume a leaf or a bean and they pull it out, it's this complex molecule that also has caffeine. As that breaks down, there's a therapeutic releasing of that caffeine. So... You might have a slow delivery system of caffeine through things like coffee and black tea, right? Even yerba mate, right? A yerba mate. But when they take decaf, you take your fingernail polish, right? The acetone, obviously super healthy. Uh, you take that and you can break the caffeine molecule off and you can make decaf coffee, decaf soda, Right? You make decaffeinated stuff, decaf tea, but now, not only is decaf toxic, but why not sell that free caffeine to places like Red Bull? But now there's not a slow delivery system. It is, boom, that much caffeine. It is like zero to 100. And if there's any susceptibility in your cardiovascular system, in a country where we have one out of two have a heart attack, we have 10-year-olds with heart disease starting. We have 20 year olds having heart attacks and strokes. Why are they having heart attacks and strokes? Because they should be. They should be. We are then over designed to have instantaneous amounts of caffeine like that injected into our system. And that's like one Red Bull, let alone two, or let alone with alcohol, which makes it even more toxic. So, think about, like, someone that drinks, like, a Red Bull and, I don't know, some, some I don't even, I only drink scotch. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know what losers drink. Probably, <laughs> all right, I don't know, what do people drink? Mm, I don't know what they mix with Red Bull. What do they mix with Red Bull? I don't even know. I hang out with some people that have Red Bull something, but that extra something, yeah, yeah, because they have like a peach something, a Vegas bomb. I think it's Vegas bomb that they were doing the other night. So these girls are doing Vegas bombs, and the the thing that makes it taste like a peach ain't peach. It's cancer causing coal tar mixed with probably uh, aspartame, which is formaldehyde. And then we have the free caffeine, and then it's probably a diet Red Bull because we don't want to get fat uh, when we have a heart attack. And but we are because aspirin is most fatty. But uh, why not have a heart attack? Why not have autoimmune problems? Why not have weird autoimmune things that nobody can figure out? Right? Which is now the autoimmune-ish thing. And I have patients all the time, all around the world that come here. Nobody can figure it out. You look at their labs, and it's just like. Yeah, that's a mess. Like, there's nothing definitive towards one specific autoimmune thing, but everything's falling apart. Um, 
stop causing it, and whoo, miraculously it goes away, right? So, easy squeezy. Mac and cheesy. Easy squeezy. <laughs> I don't remember. All right, so... <sighs> So diet makes you fatter than if you just drank 39 teaspoons of sugar. Think about that. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, my arm's tired. Six, seven, eight teaspoons. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Let me open up another thing. All right. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, let me take a break, 31, 32, 33, 34, 30, oh, we're not there, okay, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39 teaspoons of sugar will make you less fat than aspartame or diet. Don't do it. That's crazy. So the way this works is you have this neurochemistry in your brain, right? And you have about 66 hormones, and those 66 hormones uh, regulate hunger and satiety, right? Like uh, feeling full or, or done, right? Uh, so you have this expectation, like Pavlov, Pavlovian dog kind of experiment. So if I eat fruit, I know I get this much sweetness and calories. And then I'm very quickly satisfied. If I eat honey, more sweetness, my brain knows exactly how many calories, and my hunger shuts off. And then if I do stevia, hmm, what about stevia? Now, stevia is a plant. It's not toxic. But stevia, if you use it a lot, will make you fatter than if you drank sugar. So, uh, stevia is like 300 times sweeter than sugar, but there is no calorie satisfaction, so it just slowly dissipates, and then you end up not shutting off hunger. The satiation is gone. The 22 hormones that control that, there's no reason for them to work. So, it's this slow thing, and then you just overeat, right? 300% sweeter than sugar. Aspartame, neotame, sefotame, formaldehyde, is 500 times, uh, right there, 500 times sweeter than sugar, but no calories. So then people just keep overeating and eating and eating and eating and eating to try to satisfy those 22 hormones to shut off the hunger process. 44 hormones for hunger, 22 to shut that off. Your body is not designed uh, for gasoline sweeteners, and so that's why you end up gaining more weight with those. Don't be drinking formaldehyde. Let alone it's benzene. Benzene causes leukemia, lymphoma, mutation of chromosome 12, 34Q. That's what should happen. So let's talk about the dairy. So I love this topic. I really do. Uh, I always say la leche es el diablo. And we talk about this with every patient. Every patient. Because there's all this information, dairy's good and dairy's bad, and I don't like dairy because of this, and it has pus, and it has all this other stuff. Uh, pretty much whatever you eat has rat hair in there, animal carcass. It's all gross. It's all gross. We're a gross society. Gross Food's gross, right? Who cares? That's fine. Don't even worry about all that. There's just rat fingernails in your food. Like, canned goods can have so many cockroach parts in them. You know, it's all food. Don't worry about that. But dairy. So dairy's different. Dairy is a whole different beast. And what's interesting is if you look at the nomadic tribes, right? So in the Journal of Endocrinology, maybe back in 2009, uh, they had this article and it said that um, uh, dairy was directly tied to heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, but we didn't understand the mechanism until now, right? And it blew me away because it gave some real actual 
Like, I'm like, I don't care which preference is. And I understand cultures, but how did our cultural uh, changes with dairy end up where we are today, where it's actually causing more problems? And then let's talk about why I can go to Europe and eat some dairy and be perfectly fine, right? Healthiest countries, hmm? they eat some dairy. Why the hell are they not sick like us, right? So the dairy, uh, so let's start with nomadic. So, you know, in the Bible even, it's the land of milk and honey. The reason it's called the land of milk and honey is because those are rarities, right? It's not overflowing with honey everywhere. Honey's a delicacy. So, dairy's a delicacy too. There was not a cereal industry before 1940. Dr. Kellogg, Dr. Graham created cornflakes and rolled oats. Before then, what did you eat for breakfast? Whatever the hell you wanted, because you're an adult. Right? When I was over in Paris, uh, no, no, when I was over in uh, Japan, I stayed with the Otas, wonderful, loving couple. Um, Chiaru was their daughter, which is super sweet. She showed us around. But uh, Mrs. Otasan, uh, she fixed us breakfast. And it was fish, a pear, and salad. And my American brain was losing its shit about this, right? What the hell is going on here? Why are we eating fish for breakfast? Is this dinner time? Did I sleep too long? Is this 8 at night or 8 in the morning? What the hell is going on here? My American brain was about to explode. Fish for breakfast? Salad for breakfast? That made no sense. But now I realize that much of the world just eats whatever the hell they want, any time of day they want, and there isn't necessarily these delineations of what breakfast food is, lunch food, dinner food, that's all post-World War II convenience that started with cereal changing that game. Cereal did not taste very good with water. Milk, sugar, and morphine. Hmm? Well, we need a little morphine in the morning, right? So then dairy was a way better choice for this. And then by the 1960s, men were at work, women were at work. All of a sudden, we need convenience. Cereal was there. By the 1960s, we started adding coal tar colors and coal tar flavors that caused cancer and, and, and uh, uh, dyslexia and learning disorders and uh, ADHD and ADD. You know, like those studies are well published that those artificial colors decrease the brain growth by 3,000% for yellow and blue, 5,000% MSG by 8,000%. And we dumbed down our children, our entire population from 1960 to 1964 to where we went from the smartest country in the world to now one of the dumbest countries in the world. We used to be below, uh, below Slovenia when we were 19. I had to change my talks. We are now 22nd smartest country in the world. So we don't care that we're dumbing down our population because it made huge amounts of profit, but it changed an entire nation's perception of what breakfast, lunch, and dinner is. So now there became a hu huge milk lobby. Now there became tons of milk. Now you only can be healthy if you drink gallons and gallons of milk from an animal that eats salad. So, long before World War II, people drank a little dairy here and there, right? So nomadic tribes even drank dairy, but they would drink dairy during the first and second trimesters of that cow's pregnancy right? Or any cow can make a little bit of milk if you stimulate its nipples and all that kind of stuff, to, like nursemaids, you know? But the goal was not to steal all the milk from the cow and the baby so you can have your cereal. It was nurse a little bit of the milk out for little things in the first and second trimester. Hormones in there it's like growth factor one and, and estradiol. So think about all the estrogenic uh, problems that we have, endometriosis and fibroids and breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate problems, man boobs, all this stuff. It was extremely low in the first and second trimester. Third trimester starts skyrocketing postpartum. It's through the roof. Americans drink postpartum milk. That milk ain't for that baby cow. That baby cow can go to hell and drink some soy milk for all I care. 
I'm now the baby cow. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Why is stuff growing? Right? It should grow. We'll talk about this. So, when nomadic tribes were consuming little bits of milk, just like honey, it was the least hormonal, the least detrimental product you could get. They're not stealing from the cow to do this stuff. Because the cow needs them, or the baby calf needs the milk, not all the people. So, then when we look at things like, why do we have to drink milk? Well, as the milk industry uh, bloomed, they created huge lobbies. And those lobbies then uh, worked organizations like the American Diabetic, or sorry, the American Dietetic Association, uh, the American Board of Nutrition, the ABN, and then we created the American College of Clinical uh, American College of Nutrition, which then took over that board. Um, actually, Dr. G owns the American Board of Nutrition. Thank you very much. Or the American Board of Functional Medicine does now. So, but anyways, long before all that, um, they then lobbied, and then that helped create policy, because the way American politics works is if I have a company and I want or an industry and I'm a lobbyist, I will get you into the government. We'll help fund your campaign and then you implement us into your national policy. So why is cancer causing chemicals allowed? Because the companies that make them now have key people in places like the FDA and the EPA and the USDA that used to work for those companies are now the people overseeing those companies because of political appointments. That's why Monsanto uh, has people from Clarence Thomas to Hillary Clinton to the food czar to uh, Donald Rumsfeld all throughout the government since Reagan making sure that we do not say drink less milk, use less GMO, <laughs> don't make policies for the government and ban chemicals and don't even put warning labels on chemical or foods to let parents know it causes learning disorders because people will buy less product and in America that's all that really matters so this whole world changed this whole country changed because of cereal so let's ask a really good question here when they changed all these policies, they then had to justify why everybody needed to drink copious amounts of dairy. And they said, well, it's full of vitamin D. How's the vitamin D get in there? Uh, we synthesize it from petroleum, uh, and then we add it to it. <laughs> Not from the goddamn cow. It is from petroleum. Should that make you sick? It should absolutely make you sick, Right? Guess where you can get vitamin D for free? Uh, hmm. Not the daughter. Not the dad. Not the mom. <gasps> the son. The son. Oh, but it causes cancer. Mm, not until we put cancer-causing chemicals in there like benzene, which causes leukemia, lymphoma, and cancer. And then we've seen it double. Then we added more benzene, and then it quadrupled. And then we added even more aggressive SPF benzene, and then it went through the roof, and now we blame the sun. Now you can't go in the sun because it's going to cause cancer. But only since we've been putting more and more toxic cancer-causing chemicals on your skin, and now you don't get your vitamin D. And we take drugs that lower cholesterol, and cholesterol makes vitamin D, like statins. So drink milk. <laughs> So we take cancer-causing petroleum, we make synthetic vitamin D, D2, and that's supposed to prevent or help us get the vitamin D, the statins prevented, and all the scaring, uh, scaring of the sun uh, prevents us, and then what the hell is going on? We should all be sick from that. Absolutely. It's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So, what else about the nutrition? Well, that's where you get calcium from. Holy crap. If I drink dairy, I can have super strong bones. 
Like a cow. Where'd the cow get its strong bones? Where'd the mom cow get its strong bones? What did it eat? Oh, it nurses from other cow. No. It eats cereal with a lot of milk. No. Where does a cow get all its calcium from? Salad. The cow eats salad, makes bones six times stronger than a human, dumps so much extra calcium from all that salad into the dairy, and now you have to drink and breastfeed from a cow if you want strong bones. But unless you live in countries where they don't have cows, because we imported the cows over here, uh, I think cows are from South America. Are they? Where the hell are cows from? Uh, they're not native here. So that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's ridiculous. What about the protein? Oh, milk's full of protein. I need protein. Oh, I just got to get some protein to nurse from a cow for the rest of my life. If I could just nurse a cow, I could get all my protein. But where does the cow that makes the milk get all the protein? Whey supplements. I see cows scooping out whey powder so they can get super strong and make that 1,200 pounds of muscle and have so much extra they can dump it in the dairy. No, that's not true. Maybe they do green protein, which is peas. You know, peas. Peas are full of protein. Peas. You guys are, you guys are scooping out green protein. It's from your god dang vegetables. So the cow gets all that extra protein from salad. It eats salad all day long. Salad. Did it go to a seminar to figure out what kind of salad to eat? No. It just walks around and eats salad. And there's so much protein in salad that you can make a gigantic animal. You can make a brontosaurus. Its bones are this big around. A brontosaurus. Mmm. 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 Hmm? A giraffe's bones are this big, his neck bone. Giraffe is that big. His vertebra, huge, right? Massive, massive vertebra. Where the hell did he get all the protein for all the muscles for that giraffe and all the calcium for that bone? It eats cows. No, no, <laughs> that's dumb. It nurses from cows. No, that doesn't sound right. Where does an elephant get all this? Calcium and protein. What about a bull? What about an ox? Oh, salad. Salad. Just salad. You know how crazy it is to say salad has protein? It does, right? I eat a handful of uh, a handful of uh, cauliflower, three cutie oranges, three like sweet peppers, one third of my daily protein. Handful of nuts, handful of seeds, 120% of your daily protein. Handful of quinoa, 60% of your daily protein. You will never need protein if you eat real, actual food. Only if you, eat, if you eat only salad, you get protein, all the protein. You eat fruits and vegetables, salad, that's what a gorilla eats six times stronger than humans. So, why the hell does everybody think they have to nurse from a cow like they're a baby calf to get their protein? Because that's what the lobby industry made the food or the uh, boards that teach the dietetics, dietitians, that's, that's what they learn. But no one questions this, right? So when it comes to estrogen then, uh, Harvard years ago said dairy is more estrogenic or so estrogenic that it scares them more than plastic, Right? It can cause anal genital malformation or dissexual, uh, uh, dimorphic sexual phenotyping in babies, right? It can actually, if you guys don't know, all girls, all boys start off as girls, right? Uh, so if you have Y chromosome, girl parts turn, turn into boy parts. So ovaries descend and become testicles. The uterus shrivels up and becomes a prostate. Breast tissue doesn't change. Every man has nipples because every man can have, has milk glands and we can all nurse a baby. Every man can produce milk. Some of us are so extra manly, we can produce extra milk. <gasps> I can make my own milk and get super strong and have strong bones. 
Why don't we self-nurse? We could all make milk. We should just self-nurse. Then we don't have to exploit these cows. As a concerned American, I feel like we should self-nurse. Maybe the Donner Party should have tried that. Maybe that live group from the South America when they crashed in the mountains, they should have just like nursed. So, it's ridiculous, y'all. Absolutely ridiculous. But, the estrogen amount that you make is this much. The estrogen amount that's in breast milk from a cow is that much. The amount of inside growth factor in dairy is that much. The whole purpose of dairy from any animal, from human to donkey milk, uh, don't drink mule milk. That's a joke, right? <laughs> I won't fall for that twice. But donkey milk, goat milk, it's all the same. The whole goal is to grow a baby as fast as humanly possible outside the uterus so the mom can get the hell on with her life. So cow breast milk is designed to take a 75-pound baby to uh, 500 to 1,000 pounds in less than a year so mom can get the hell on, right? The way you grow something a thousand pounds in less than a year is astronomical amounts of hormones. So in that research, why do we end up with endometriosis, fibroids, fibrocystic breast, uh, polycystic ovarian, infertility, um, um, what endometriosis, uh, breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, male breasts. The number one elective surgery for men in the United States is breast reduction surgery. Men are growing breasts at alarming rates. That would save me from dating. Oh, thanks. Um, so, it's insane. Prostates are trying to grow back into a uterus. We are literally converting men back into original female form. And we've completed this in nature with like the whip tail. The whip tail lizard. We've done it to the trout. We've done it to the salmon. We've done it to the frog. And you know, dairy is a huge part. Plastics, pesticides, herbicides, all this estrogen, right? But research shows that, um, what is it? Uh, 60 to 80% of all the estradiol, so that's out of your three estrogens, two protect you. Well, that's not. And one, grow stuff. That's estradiol. That's your puberty one, right? So, should be growing tissue, estrogen tissue, after puberty, and men certainly shouldn't be uh, creating uh, prostates in the uteruses and breast tissue, right? But the research um, shows that 60 to 80 percent of your extra or excess estradiol in Western America comes from dairy. Dairy. 85% of the American diet is corn, soy, wheat, and dairy. Dairy is estrogenically off the charts. So what about people that have ER positive cancer? So all these women have breast cancer. The estrogen receptor positive. Well, guess what? Research shows that estradiol in that 60 to 80 percent of extra dairy that you or estra, uh, estradiol that you get from dairy in the U.S. diet, that is enough to change that target gene and cause estrogenic sensitive cancers. So this is the most screwed up thing ever. We literally cause this stuff. Oh, well, go do this expensive research. Go to these specialists. Oh, my God, it's estrogen dominant. What am I going to do? Uh, stop causing it? <laughs> but we don't do that as Americans. And I joke about this stuff. Because, good Lord, patients all around the world. And, like, you know, it's so easy for most of the things. And, you know, helping all these people. But the stuff I know, most people just do. They don't know. When I teach this stuff to patients, they don't know this stuff. And the people in charge of their health care from a day-to-day -day basis is telling them to consume chemicals and foods and drinks that absolutely research shows causes these cancers. And we don't give one shit about that because we have lobbies that say, ah, it's fine. 
When our FDA said we were going to put warning labels on candies to let you know it causes ADHD, ADD, mental brain dysfunction, dyslexia, learning disorders, our FDA voted no. When our FDA was voting to whether we were going to keep estrogenic, horribly toxic, endocrine disrupting bisphenol A in baby products, nipples, pacifiers, uh, chew toys, we, our FDA, said it's fine. Freaking Walmart then banned it. Walmart. Walmart. Our FDA is fine with your kids having horribly amount, horrible amounts of estrogenic, hormone disrupting, disexual morph, or dimorphic sexual phenotyping chemical, neurological disruptive chemical, impedes the improvement of their sexual development. So we have amorphic genitalia now. We have hypo uh, hypo uh, uh, phallus. We have all these crazy ass things that we're doing, we're changing the hypothalamus, uh, are stalling out from female to male development. And we don't care because it's profitable. Walmart interjected on our behalf. Now, do they still poison adults? Hell yeah. Right, that stuff's still in canned goods and sodas and beer, and who cares about that? But at least let's maybe make it less toxic for the babies. Not known toxic, but less toxic. Walmart. All right. So, I hope you guys enjoy this. This stuff, I have the hardest time not cussing through all this because this is so messed up. And it's so blatantly obvious once you know all the things and how things work. It is not why do one out of two people in America end up with cancer. It is not why does one out of two end up with heart attack and stroke. It is not why does one out of two have a high, uh, is currently type 2 diabetic or will be within three to five years. It's not why does three out of four Americans have chronic inflammatory conditions that they're chronically managing with medication and supplements. It is absolutely they should have those. Everybody that has a condition should have that condition. And that's the facts. That's the hard truth. It's not genetic. It's not genetic. Women are getting their breasts cut off because of a BRAC gene that has a 5% likelihood of causing breast cancer. 5%. I'm cutting my titties off. Hair dye to cover up the gray or to make your hair purple is made from coal tar, which causes cancer that has been shown in uh, 2019 uh, to cause an increase of breast cancer by 10% and 50% in black women because hair dye is racist. No, because uh, they use more products. They have coal tar, which causes cancer. You can drink coal tar and die. There's no antidote. Instantly kill you. Coal tar. <laughs> What if we just get a little bit in here? Well, then we get breast cancer. I am in, living in a population where women will get their breasts cut off for 5% and won't even know that their hair product is doubling that risk. And no one is telling them a thing about that. We should have all these. That's the truth. So... We don't have to. That's why ignorance and complacency is the thing that's keeping us chronically sick and dying prematurely. So as we go through this, my goal is constantly knowledge for you guys. You still make the horrible decisions. I still make bad decisions from time to time. Y'all see me drink my martini, smoke a cigar once in a while. But hopefully I'm doing this much bad and this much good. Right? It's not perfection. We're not going to get a non-toxic world. We live in one of the fattest, dumbest, sickest populations with the most anxiety and depression. And if we keep doing what they do, that's going to be you. But we don't have to be. We can be healthy, happy, and balanced and have overwhelming reduction of toxicity 
in this country. So, all right, my time's up. So boxing done. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, the next episode in this series, and we'll talk about foods and chemicals and why you should be sick from them. So that will probably be a couple weeks of talking about that nonsense. Holy crap. I hope you guys enjoy this. I love you guys. I thank you guys for watching, especially all the people that watch offline. Um, you know, post your questions, your comments. Um, this is pretty pretty messed up. I hope this helps. I really do. All the stuff we talk about, I really hope that, you know, like we're planting seeds here. And when people finally get sick and tired of being sick and tired and get sick of chronically managing, people get off all their medications almost always. Like success rates are almost like 95 to 100% if they'll do what they're supposed to do. It is not rocket science to be healthy and happy. It's not. It's just a hero's journey, which we've talked about before. Having a mentor, holding their hand, crossing the threshold, and not rejecting or refusing to change. But challenging yourself, going through the test, losing frenemies, losing enemies, finding your new allies, finding your right tribe, overcoming your self-doubt which is the worst, their innermost cave of do I even deserve to be healthy? Can I really just be happy? Right? Then going through bigger ordeals, figuring out you are this new person, refining that into a new person, and then eventually becoming the light for other people. Not shining the light on them, because that doesn't work. Helping people that don't want your help it's the worst. Such good intentions and the worst outcome. You can only help people that are so sick and tired that they will do anything to feel better again and to be happy. That's the people you focus on. People that are drawn to your light, that want to be healthy and happy. All right. Bye, y'all. Glad y'all joined. And make sure to share this with people you don't like and you want to ruin their lives by ruining their food and drinks.